Hello, I'm Julia Maxton, President of the South Metro Regional Chamber of Commerce, and this is the South Metro Chamber of Commerce Business Briefs. Hi, I'm Dave Tillotson. I'm the Director of the National Museum of the United States Air Force, and I'm here to talk to you today a little bit about the United States Air Force and you. Uh, so before I uh, inundate you with all things museum, let me give you a little bit of background about myself. I am a 47-year uh, veteran of the Department of the Air Force. I spent 26 years on active duty, first in air, the air defense business and then later in program management. Um, I then moved over to the civil service at the senior executive level where I was the deputy Air Force CIO, the deputy chief management officer, and I was the deputy chief management officer for the Department of Defense for a number of years before I came out here. Uh, while I am not a native o of Ohio, I do note um, to all Ohioans and all folks from the local area that this is the first job in 47 years in the Air Force that I asked for and got. So I'm actually here enthusiastically um, looking forward to working the, working the job and I have been in the job now for three years. So why the U.S. Air Force and you? Um, when people think about the United States Air Force Museum, um, they tend to think about um, this. They think about this large group of hangars, mostly they think airplanes. It is a million square feet of available real estate and certainly there are lots of airplanes to see. But you know what, in this month, which is November of 2021, where we're honoring veterans, maybe the time is here to talk a little bit about what the Air Force has done that interacts with society and what Air Force people have done that interact with society and see how that looks. Uh, through the perspective of the museum. And these things that I'm going to show you are all things you can see at the museum, but sometimes you have to look in a corner to find them. I start with the first enlisted airman, Corporal Eddie Ward. Um, sure enough, like most enlisted folks, many enlisted folks in the Air Force today, um, starts life as a maintainer in the Army Air Service. But he is far more than that. He is a balloon pilot, not a maintainer, a pilot. He actually um, flies lighter than airships spends his early career working with the Army Air Service doing many developmental kinds of issues. At the end of his career, he is working with an agency called the National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics, and he helps install the very first wind tunnel at Langley Field for that agency. The National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics is, today is known as NASA, so NASA's first wind tunnel and Corporal Eddie Ward. The Air Force Museum is not just about airplanes. It's also about other kinds of development activities. And from the period from 1909 to 1939, there is what I call the first golden age of aviation development. 1909 is when the first Wright Brothers airplane is delivered to the United States Army. But there are developments that occur shortly after World War I that begin to set the tone for a new generation of aviation. On the left in this picture, the thing that looks like a propeller with wings, but no, no place for a person, is the Kettering Flying Bug. This is an aerial torpedo, which as a weapon was a complete bust. But as a development step in the, in the history of aviation is significant. This vehicle could pilot itself in a direction, at an altitude, maintain that altitude and heading and calculate a distance before it terminated its flight. This is the start of autopilot. This is the start of devices having automatic feedback between sensors in their environment and interaction with their environment. Tesla today drives a car on the road that interacts with its environment and the start of this technology comes during this time period right here in Ohio. The picture on the right of the engine with the propeller on it represents the next step in engine development. Early engines, much like your automobile engine, again unless you drive a Tesla, and if uh, at altitudes above 10,000 feet, their power starts to drop off dramatically. So the development of a device called the turbo supercharger starts. And by 1919 to 1920, an engine that was designed to fly at 9,000 feet is going all the way to 33,000 feet and maintaining full power during that time. Now, I don't know about you, but my wife with her turbocharged four-cylinder uh, Subaru Outback certainly can outrun my four-cylinder Prius um, without even breaking a sweat. So that's the technology you see in your automobiles today and it starts during this time period. The aviation industry pursued a number of means to kind of foster development and much like the early automobile industry, races became a background for doing that. The picture on the left that you're looking at is a picture of Jimmy Doolittle and his friend uh, Clyde Bettis who in 1925 participated in two international races. First the Schneider Cup, which is the seaplane on the lower right, and the other is the Pulitzer Race, which is for land planes. 
Jimmy Doolittle wins the Schneider Cup, the only time an Army team enters a seaplane race, and uh, Bettis wins the Pulitzer race that same year in 1924-1925. And the only difference, by the way, between the two planes is they took the pontoons off one and put the wheels on. So it's the same airplane as it turns out. Jimmy Doolittle um, is the first person to earn a doctorate in aeronautical engineering in the United States and, um, and more famously goes on in military history to lead the Doolittle Raid on Tokyo. But he starts his career as a development, as a development power in the Army Air Force uh, in aviation. During the period of the 1920s, uh, there are some early long-range flights that the Army undertakes as a means to both project the image of the United States abroad, but also to begin to develop aviation routes and to see what it takes to actually fly in long distances. The column on the left is the Douglas Around the World flight. Four aircraft start off to fly all the way around the world. At various times, they have landing gear and other times they have pontoons because in these days there are not a lot of airfields, so you would basically have to adapt to the conditions that you went on. On the right is the Pan American flight, which went all the way down the east coast of South America down to the tip and then came all the way back up the west coast. And again, four Army aircraft doing this back in the days of biplanes. These are two significant achievements and they paved the way for a commercial airline industry that at least initially is based on uh, seaplanes and long distance aviation and help uh, chart aeronautical charts um, in the early, early development of aviation. The Army was also asked by the nation to assist in developing the infrastructure of the nation. The ground army was asked to survey routes and roads out in the western United States which were still under development while the flying part of the Army was asked to create maps. Good maps of the United States were, no, were non-existent at the time, so after World War I, the camera in the lower right was developed so that it would actually stitch images together to form a mapping image that could uh, then be used to create cartography products and map products that could be used by the general public as well as by engineers and others, and the aircraft immediately behind it is dedicated to that mission. The blue and yellow aircraft in the upper left is the Martin B-10. And this is the aircraft that then Colonel Hap Arnold took a flight of up to Alaska and they did similar mapping missions in the state of Alaska which was a relatively unexplored territory at the time. And so good development for the United States. So your army in between World War I and World War II um, is actually doing um, significant things to help uh, foster the infrastructure of the United States and provide a background. Right here in the Dayton area, um, very significant developments are taking place. If you were in the United States Army from the 1920s through the 1950s, Wright Field and McCook Field were the centers of aviation development. And the Army built its development center here for aviation because back in the day, if you wanted to learn to fly, early U.S. Army aviators wanted to learn to fly, there were only two guys they could talk to and their names were Orville and Wilbur. And they were right here in Dayton. So the Army builds its development center here. At McCook Field on the left, you can see the development of airplane landing lights and other safety devices that begin to be developed as the, we push the limits of aviation into night flying and all weather conditions moving forward. In World War I, pilots didn't have parachutes. So between World War I and World War II, uh, the Army expends a lot of time and effort on developing emergency freefall parachuting. And you can see a picture of one of the early experimenters sliding off the wing of that biplane bomber. So if you can imagine taking off, hanging onto the wing of an airplane until it gets to altitude and then sliding off the wing for your first jump, this is what would happen. And of course, a bit being the US Army, it's gonna be some poor enlisted guy who gets voluntold that this is what he has to do. But the Parachute Museum right here in Dayton, Ohio documents all of this as well as this um, exhibit at the Air Force Museum. Early high altitude research um, took place in forms other than aircraft. That's because aircraft basically struggled to get to about 30 or 35,000 feet. So to get people up to higher altitudes and test, uh, do physiological experiments, the Army and the civilian community used balloons. So Explorer 1 and 2 represented some of those early experimental flights where passengers would fly to 50 and 60,000 feet and uh, evaluate physiological conditions, the ability to survive, what were the temperatures, what were the weather conditions, and so forth. We also discovered that uh, you had to be careful about creating the size of the balloon bag big enough so that it would allow for gas expansion. You can see a small picture on the right there where the bag has basically exploded and the good news is all three passengers got out, but some of the Artifacts at the bottom represent the, the remnants of that balloon gondola after it crashed to earth here in the local area. 
On the right hand side, a person named Armstrong um, discovered that if you took an open container of blood to over 63,000 feet, it would actually start to boil off. This is called the Armstrong limit. It's still known today. What that means is that if you want to fly at altitudes above 60,000 feet in an aircraft and you're not in a pressurized environment, you have to be in a pressure suit in order to survive. So this is principles that we understand today. It's the fundamental underpinnings of the spacesuits uh, that the astronauts wear and it is the fundamental in underpinning of the full pressure suits that pe uh, people who fly at high altitudes in Air Force aircraft also have to observe. Now having said that, the aircraft that's on the bottom of the uh, right hand side of this picture is the XC-35 which flew its experiments right here at Wright Field in Dayton, Ohio. The XC-35 is the world's first fully pressurized aircraft cabin and that experiment was flown by an Army captain and Army private and the aircraft was built by Lockheed. So this is a pretty significant development. In fact, if you fly in an airliner today and you don't have to wear an oxygen mask and you can sit there in your um, shorts and your t-shirt, you may thank the Army experimenters at Wright Field uh, for that development. After World War II, which sees an explosion of technology as a result of the war, including the development of jets and rockets, research picks up again in the 50s and 60s, what I refer to as the second golden age of aviation. And you will see that in the fourth building of the Air Force Museum. There's a very eclectic collection of very bizarre looking aircraft, all of which are designed to push the speed and altitude envelopes of airplanes, to test shapes, to test whether or not you can make the wings move on an airplane and still have it fly. The XB-70, which sits in the center of that, is designed to fly at 70,000 feet at three times the speed of sound, and did, by the way. And these are significant aviation developments that contribute to the general advancement of technology once again. This era is very expensive, so you see the government and NASA getting involved in the research along with the, pri with the companies that are actually doing the work. And all of these aircraft have not just Air Force markings, but in many cases have a NASA marking on them as well, because this is a shared research environment. As we move back and even higher altitudes than we did in the 30s, we begin to send animals up in rockets to test their response to high acceleration, heavy G loads, uh, heavy gravity loads, and also to high altitude flights. So you see on the left hand side of this, the mouse and the monkey. This was an early research vehicle that was basically sent to 120,000 feet, basically testing the response of the animals to the acceleration and the um, ride. Two monkeys, two mice made the trip. They all survived, for the record. The two monkeys lived out their lives at the National Zoo. The two mice lived out their lives in the lab, but certainly survived the experiment. The chimpanzee on the right is Ham. He is famously the first creature to ride in the Mercury capsule. So he actually flew and it, he actually had things he had to do on his Mercury mission. He had to move switches and so forth. But again, it was an experiment in um, not just how do you survive the G-forces, but can you actually operate things under high acceleration. All of these experiments were successful. All of the animals involved certainly survived their experience and um, went on to live a complete life. Having said that, we didn't just experiment with animals. We also sent people up. Much like the 20s and 30s, the ability to get to high altitude with spacecraft initially was restricted. So once again, we turned to balloons, now going to 80 and 100,000 feet, right to the edge of space, and to test the body's reaction to that environment, as well as taking instruments up to that level to see, for example, we took a telescope to that altitude to see what astronomy would look like under those conditions and to develop what we called star navigation. The gentleman stepping out of the capsule on the left is an Air Force captain named Joseph Kittinger. Joseph Kittinger made a parachute jump from 102,000 feet to test the body's reaction to freefall in case of high altitude um, ejections from either aircraft or spacecraft as they were being developed and see what would be required. Underneath his suit, he is wearing a full pressure suit. My favorite part of the picture, however, is the duct tape, the red duct tape at the bottom of his pant leg holding his pants down so they don't blow up while he is in freefall. His boots and his mittens are standard Air Force Arctic survival gear, and he jumped from 102,000 feet. As a retired Air Force colonel, he supported a man named Felix Baumgartner, who later jumps from the edge of space at 126,000 feet. And if you ever see the video of that, Felix is a little more um, impressively attired, and his capsule is much more sophisticated looking. But again, this is where the groundwork is laid um, with, with the Air Force in the uh, series of projects called Man High. 
When you come to the museum, you'll see the Missile Gallery, and the Missile Gallery immediately grabs your attention because these are intercontinental and intermediate range ballistic missiles, and that's how most people relate to them. But the missile on the left, white missile on the lower left, is Jupiter. And that missile, that, or a cousin of that missile named Redstone, is what put the first Mercury capsule into suborbital flight. Another cousin of that missile, Jupiter C, put the first U.S. satellite in orbit. The one that looks kind of like the biggest one, uh, about three from the left, um, kind of looking like rusty aluminum, is Titan II. It's the Air Force's largest liquid-fueled ICBM. That booster put the Gemini program in orbit. All of the three rockets on the left-hand side all put space probes into orbit, satellites into orbit, in addition to doing their military mission. So this is shared space between the Air Force and the newly formed National Air and Space Agency and research that was done to not only put um, satellites in orbit, but to start the manned space program in the United States. And later on, you'll see the Mercury program, the Gemini program, and the Apollo program all represented in our galleries because, again, military pilots formed the first of the research team. We'll talk a little more about that in a couple of more slides. These aircraft represent high-speed research. Um, the lower left is the X-1B. Um, it's the cousin of the same X-1 that Chuck Yeager flew to break the speed of sound. This one flew even faster, two times the speed of sound. The upper left is the X-15. That aircraft flew as fast as 4,500 miles per hour and flew to altitudes of 67 miles, so it flew into space at very high speeds. And the picture on the lower right is what we call lifting bodies. Basically, these were experiments in designing aircraft that were without wings but still generated lift. Those three programs in the smaller pictures, the research done in those programs, which was done in conjunction with the Air Force and NASA and even the Navy at some points, resulted in the space shuttle that you see in background. So all of that early research from the military and from NASA result in the world's first reusable spacecraft. But it's not just about the tech. It's also about the contribution of veterans to changes in society. In the upper right small picture insert, if I asked you who the first African American was to fly in air combat and you tried to come up with the name of any of the Tuskegee Airmen, you'd be off by 30 years in one war. Eugene Charles Ballard in the World War I flew with a group called the Lafayette Corps. He was a veteran French Foreign Legion soldier, uh, won the Legion of Honor at Verdun, then transitions into the French Air Force and he joins with other Americans in the Lafayette Corps who are flying for the French Air Force. When that group transfers into the Army Air Service, when the U.S. enters the war, obviously he is not able to transition in. But this is the first African American in air combat and he is born in Georgia, spends much of his life living in France. He comes back to the United States during World War II. And when he is buried, he is interred in a French military cemetery in New York State with full military honors because he is a Legion of Honor and a two-war veteran from the French military. The Tuskegee Airmen are very well known to many people who are familiar with military history. The Army in World War II is a segregated service. And in World War II, a segregated service meant normally, if you had a black unit, it was black enlisted personnel commanded by white officers. The 332nd group was all black. The officers, the enlisted members, all of the support staff, and they served an exemplary record all through World War II to the point that because of their service record and the record of other segregated units during World War II, President Truman in 1948 directs by executive order the desegregation of the Department of Defense ahead of any civil rights legislation. In 1949, the Air Force becomes the first service to integrate. Um, I won't tell you that went smoothly, I won't lie to anybody, but having said that, it's still a breakthrough and a change uh, in societal direction that happens during World War II. The second major group of um, activities and um, changes that occur is the role, expanding role of women who served in World War II, both in the labor force and the home front, also in the Women's Army Corps, and, and other roles that we'll talk about in a moment. But one of the roles that women started serving in in the 20s and 30s was as nurses associated with the Army and the Navy. They were so integrated into the services that in 1942, when the U.S. Army surrenders to the Japanese at Corregidor in the Philippines, there are 50, that's digits 5-0, Army and Navy nurses who become POWs for the duration of the war. They were serving at Corregidor in combat. Army nurses went to Hap Arnold in 1941 
and suggested that we could improve the number of lives saved if the Air Force or the Army Air Force would support aeromedical evacuation of casualties from the combat zone and then from the forward area uh, back to rear echelons. So the start of aeromedical evacuation occurs during World War II at the instigation of some very brave Army nurses who flew into the beachheads of Normandy um, literally days after the, after the invasion into improvised strips and airlifted soldiers out. Um, and they served throughout the, throughout the war in various roles and continued in that role, by the way, into Korea. Again, in the 1940s, if you were a nurse, you were a woman by definition. In the 50s and 60s and into the early 70s, the role of women continued to expand in the Air Force and they expanded into what would have been considered at the time non-traditional roles. Colonel Whalen becomes the first civil engineer in the U.S. Air Force, but this is General T.C. Carter, and she is the first person to wear the title of the Air Force Civil Engineer on the Air Staff. She later goes on to be the first commander of the Installation Support Management Center, which is responsible for all Air Force bases worldwide, and she helped establish that command. Again, women's roles continue to expand during this time period. But what about that flying thing? Down in the lower left, in World War II, in 1942, Hap Arnold finally agrees to let women participate in shuttling aircraft from factories, doing training missions, and participating in taking over roles that uh, men would have had to have occupied. And they form a group known as the Women's Air Force Service Pilots, better known today as the WASPs. WASPs flew every aircraft in the Army Air Force inventory in the 1940s, up to and including the B-29 bomber. In fact, there's a very famous story of Colonel Paul Tibbetts, who is training his crew members to operate the B-29 and the male crew members are complaining about the complexity of the aircraft and some of the, uh, some of the difficulties of flying it. Uh, Paul Tibbetts trains two WASP pilots to fly the B-29 and then has the WASP pilots give orientation flights to the male pilots and for some mysterious reason the complaint stopped. Um, so a very successful story, but in 1944 the WASPs are disbanded as men come back and uh, become more available into the training force because it's still viewed as perhaps not the right role for women. It isn't until 1976, nearly 34 years later, um, that the Air Force again inducts its first official class of pilot trainees, 10 women who then graduate in 1977. And you see there are flight suits on the lower right there of that first 10 women who go into flying. Now initially, they're restricted to training missions, to cargo missions, tankers, and aeromedical evacuation. But by 2016, at the top, women are serving in all branches of the military and all services. The combat exclusion policy is lifted and basically the Department of Defense's policy is that women can serve in any role for which they can qualify. And so this is a longer journey than we saw for uh, the integration of the Air Force. So by 2016, though, we see women as being fully integrated in all roles. That role continues into space. And um, what we see on the left is a group known as the Mercury 13. Most people are familiar with the Mercury 7 astronauts, the first seven U.S. astronauts. What they don't know is that Jackie Cochran, who helped form the WASPs, went on to sponsor a group of women who went through all the same physiological training uh, for, to become an astronaut as the original Mercury 7. The lady at the bottom of that picture is named Cobb, and she is in the top 2% of all astronaut candidates, male or female. The program runs from 1959 to 1961, but in 1961, Congress decides they're not going to continue with the program and that the first astronauts will be male combat test pilots, and that would be the qualification. So they are disbanded as a group. The women go on to do other things, and in 1963, the Soviet Union puts Valentina Tereshkova, the first woman, into orbit two years after the end of this program in the United States. It isn't until 1983 that the first U.S. woman goes into orbit, and that's um, Sally Ride, who's a civilian. The first U.S. astronaut is Susan Helms, who flies in 1993, so decades later for women to get back into space and certainly women in the Air Force. But Eileen Collins, who's a test pilot, becomes the first woman to command a space shuttle. And Pam Melroy, who's on the left, is a later space shuttle commander, but on one of her International Space Station resupply missions, the commander of the International Space Station is also a woman. So the two commanders meet in space, two women meeting for the first time in command roles. So significant changes going forward at the time. During World War II, airlift becomes a, a discipline of significance. In fact, on at least one military operation in World War II, 
the line of C-47 transports and gliders doing an airdrop was 96 miles long and three miles wide. That's how many airplanes we could put into the air at the time. That's a significant force leverage, force multiplier. And that tradition continues through today where we still maintain significant ability to put um, people um, into places and to resupply them. But how does that come to affect society as a whole? Well, the first opportunity we have is in 1948 when the Soviet Union, who has not seen streams of aircraft 96 miles long and three miles wide, decide to blockade the city of Berlin and cuts off all water and land transportation, but mistakenly leaves the air corridors open. And as a result, in 1948, the Allies, in particular the U.S., starts the Berlin airlift. And for 15 months, the U.S. and the United Kingdom in particular resupply the city of Berlin with an airplane arriving at Tempelhof Airport every three minutes to keep a city alive for 15 months. That requires not just the crew members on the airplanes, it requires the loading crew, it requires all the supplies that you can see in the upper corner, but the airlift gets so efficient that by the end of the airlift there are pilots dropping chocolates to kids, we're moving a camel out of a zoo, and we're delivering nylons just because we could. And by that time, the Soviets got the message and decided that this blockade thing was not working out for them. Uh, and they lift, this, they lift the blockade in 1949. That mission um, rolls of various airlift aircraft continues today. This is a picture of a C-130 doing forest firefighting out in the western United States. And there is one Air Force Reserve unit and one Air National Guard unit who are specifically trained to do the forest firefighting mission. And they modify their cargo aircraft to become part of that force in response to the forestry service and to the state authorities. Helicopters begin to appear in 1942. The helicopter in the lower left is the 1942 Sikorsky. It sees combat service in 1944 and among its first missions is rescue. Over on the upper right are helicopters from the Korean War period and the Air Force continues to evolve aerospace rescue and recovery using helicopters during the Korean War. During the Vietnam War, the helicopter in the center is modified so that it can actually be refueled in flight to provide the ability to reach out and rescue downed airmen even in enemy territory. Why is that capability significant? This is a picture of a modern day Air Force rescue and recovery helicopter picking up a crew member off of a fishing trawler at sea. The helicopter that you see hovering there is a 300 mile range helicopter, meaning without any refueling service, it can go 300 miles. That ship is 600 miles off the coast. So that helicopter flew 1,200 miles, had to be refueled several times. So this wasn't just about the helicopter, it's all about the entire rescue and recover capability that the Air Force can now bring today, simply to go rescue a civilian who is in distress on a fishing trawler. By the way, that picture is now four weeks old. During World War II, the U.S. Army experiments with operations in the Arctic, and nothing says operations in the Arctic like landing an amphibious aircraft with its landing gear up on the Greenland ice pack, which is the picture you see on the left. A man named Brent Balchin, a Norwegian, works with the U.S. Army Air Force to develop techniques for working in the Arctic environment. These techniques for working in the Arctic environment are not just there for military purposes, however. In 1956, the U.S. Navy initially, and then in 1999, the U.S. Air Force take on another mission called Deep Freeze. Deep Freeze means that the Air Force flies resupply missions to the entire scientific community on the continent of Antarctica every Antarctic summer. This is the 109th Airlift Wing with its ski-equipped C-130s landing in Antarctica to do resupply missions for the international scientific community. And you can tell it's Antarctic summer because it's daylight. But this happens every year and has happened every year since 1956. That's the story of your U.S. Air Force. It's a story you can see at your U.S. Air Force Museum. We invite you to come out. Here's the good news. It's free. You just have to get yourself there. It's free to park. It's free to walk in. We'd enjoy having you. Please wear comfortable shoes. It is a million square feet on concrete. Um, we do look forward to having you, both we, our compatriots at the Air Force Museum Foundation, and, and we at the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force. This is your museum. So when you do come visit, bring your kids. Take a little bit of time to walk them through the corners of the exhibits and talk to them about how science uh, has played and continues to play a role. Um, there's an opportunity for your kids to interact with some of the aircraft. Um, you can walk through some of our cargo aircraft. We have sit-in cockpits that are, in fact, full-size cockpits from various of the aircraft that they can sit and interact with. 
there are um, exhibits of science um, that they can actually participate in. And we encourage you to come out and be an interactive part of this experience.